we're in a dark age. We've lost our compass. We don't know who we are. We don't know where we want to go. Our own lives are an experience of inadequacy and tension. We are a world dying under anesthesia for lack of authentic connection with the living world out of which we came. What is to be done? My name is Brian Rose, and every day I speak with some of the greatest minds on the planet. Broadcasting messages of inspiration to the world. Convincing myself that I'm making a difference. But when I look outside my studio, I see a very different picture. I see a world divided. Anger. Separation. Humanitarian crisis growing by the day. Insanity. The fires have spanned millions of acres. Because we are nearing a point of no return. But it's not just outside. It's also inside me. Somehow in this age of ultra-connectivity, I also feel separated. Something's missing, and I can't figure out what it is. All my life, I tried to find happiness by achieving things. I'm not sure why, but I always wanted to be the best. I mean, who doesn't, right? It's all about performance, success, winning. Along the way, I met some interesting people and a few who wanted to win even more than me. I want you to kill, 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 kill. Run towards the gunfire and kill them all. They pushed me to go even harder, and this winning became an obsession. I believe that we're put on this planet to be all we can be. See, I act as like it's the last two minutes of my last fucking Super Bowl every fucking hour of the day. I just wanted more and more and more. But you can't deny, it got some major results. This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. And everyone seemed to love it. Yet it also began to take over my life. And sometimes I get the feeling that it's actually making things worse. Who knows what would have happened if I didn't get that call. Hi, Brian. It's good to see you. This is Dennis McKenna, and a call from him means things are about to get complicated. You see, Dennis is a leading scientist in the study of psychedelics, powerful mind-altering chemicals. He has a different way of looking at things and radical ideas about how to change the world. We had some cool conversations back in the day that I had almost forgotten about. You can think of psychedelics as a scientific instrument to explore the range of consciousness. Psychedelics are dangerous, not because they're dangerous drugs. It's because they make you have dangerous ideas. Right. They make you doubt the program 
This is a war on consciousness. And so, these plants are our bioweapons. Hmm. Just ours don't kill people. Ours, ours force people to think. Right. <laughs> I've been working with this new retreat center in Costa Rica called Salterra, and uh, I'm going down there next week, and I was thinking this is a chance for us to re reconnect and for you to uh, re-experience ayahuasca. You know it's been a while. Ayahuasca, a plant medicine that has been used by indigenous people in the Amazon for thousands of years. The brew is a mixture of two plants, one of which contains DMT known as the spirit molecule, the most powerful mind-altering substance nature has created. It's been six years since I last drank it, and often the effect is to give you an honest assessment of exactly what's wrong with you, loud and clear. These medicines, effectively, they're a reset, you know, of our perspective. I think your hard drive is a bit fragged, this will put it back together in a more functional way. I mean, look, I'm sure that there's a lot I can learn from the medicine. Like, I won't, I won't deny that. But, you know, this just seems to be too, too soon, too crazy. I just don't think I'm ready to just drop everything. This is more important than what you're doing right now. I, I can almost guarantee you. Dennis is obviously crazy. I can't leave my business to go to the jungle for a week. Winners don't take days off. I like success. Doing deals and doing one after another after another. I mean, it's, it's, it's an aphrodisiac. I'm high on life. I don't need DMT or Iowa fuck, fuck, why do that's all horse shit? Those are for losers. I just wondered, what, what do you think about psychedelics and, and what do they do and what don't I they do? I have no idea what they do. What we don't understand about psychedelics is a very thick book. They bend the structure of reality. What they reveal to me is how little we know about everything. That's a terrifying thing. Something to be investigated further? With great risk, they can help you orient yourself morally. But... Look the hell out. The truth is, my work is taking over my life. It's becoming an addiction, an obsession. If I continue like this, something's going to break. I know it. Going on this trip is my only chance to stop it. This movie is unlike anything we've ever done. It's a total lack of control, which obviously makes me nervous. In three days time, I am traveling to Costa Rica to participate in three ayahuasca ceremonies. And I think I've already forgotten how emotional and how emotionally draining this experience is gonna be. You know, the, the convulsions, the purging, the... We literally are going to see what Mother Ayahuasca wants to do with me, with the show, with the message out to the world. So this is her chance to broadcast. I'm looking forward to hanging out with Dennis. It's been a while. And his brother, Terrence, uh, had a major impact on me. And even though he died in 2000, his recorded verse and poetic way of speaking is still extremely relevant today. The key is the psychedelic experience. That's what makes the shaman a shaman. That's what made the archaic, in fact, archaic. They prepare people for transformation. It gets you used to the idea that the world is not what it appears to be. We're in San Jose, Costa Rica right now, taking two flights, and now we got a three and a half hour drive ahead of us. 
I got an ayahuasca ceremony tomorrow. I think we'll get some sleep, but it's been a long ass day. Shoe. Shoe next to the thing. There's a scorpion in the house. There's fire ants that are attacking the scorpion. There's like moths flying everywhere. We're definitely in the jungle. So um, look, we're here, we're gonna get some sleep. And then tomorrow is the big night of the ceremony. But yeah, planes, trains, and automobiles today. My God, what's that? I was just thinking that in London, you're not surrounded by anything in nature, really. There's a few parks. So it's easy to forget about it and not think that it really matters as long as your Uber comes on time and your latte is ready and your organic eggs are cooked for you. But out here, it's pretty damn obvious that the plants are in charge. Hi, how are you? Hello. I guess we're in the right spot, right? How are you, sir? How are you? Good. Great to see you. Dennis, thanks for having me here. Well, thank you for coming. Um, it's great to see you here. I kind of never thought we'd be sitting here together. I mean, I'm feeling a bit of trepidation, as, as is probably normal. It's absolutely normal. If you don't have butterflies in your stomach, you're not paying attention. <laughs> right. Well, I'm paying attention. <laughs> yeah. And, and so what is your view on what's happening inside the psychedelic experience? Well, the first thing to get clear is I'm not here to tell you what's going to happen. I mean, what happens will be what happens between you and the medicine. That's always the way it is. A good shaman... Their job is to set the setting, set the context, and step out of the way. Because the real teaching, the real teacher is the medicine. In the current language of, uh, of neuroscience, what do these things actually do? They disrupt what they call the default mode network. Your ego is shut up, and you can open yourself up to all these other things that you never pay attention to. And then you realize, wow, I'm missing a lot. These are very important. In some ways, more important than what your, your ego and your default mode network forces you to look at all the time. We say that you don't always get what you want with ayahuasca, but you always get what you need. Hola. You can speak about your intentions here, anything that's weighing on you, whatever you want Wheeler to know. Because of, of course, this informs him of, of where you are in your in your journey, and then kind of as he comes into the medicine space with you, 
kind of where he directs his energy, the ikados he chooses, and how he infuses his intention into those songs. So wherever you'd like to begin. Okay. Uh, buenas noches. Um, and thank you for having us. Um, my name's Brian. I'm from London. And uh, I'm just here to to listen tonight and to uh, get some feedback on if I'm doing the right things with my life. And if I'm not, uh, sometimes I feel uh, anxious and unappreciative of the things I have. And so I'm really open to anything that is told to me tonight. La ayahuasca nos fortalece nuestra mente, nos abre nuestra creatividad, nuestro amor, donde cuando nosotros estamos perdidos espiritualmente, cuando tenemos desviado nuestra mente, nos centra, nos conecta uno a uno mismo. Antiguamente los chipivos no conocían lo que es la farmacia. Entonces, ¿qué era nuestra farmacia, nuestros hospitales? Los árboles que vemos aquí, las plantas, conocimientos, está ahí. Y nosotros simplemente que guiamos a través de nuestro espíritu de las plantas, ¿no? Las plantas nos enseñan muchas cosas en la vida. Es un aspecto to bring to the ceremony, es to just have faith in the plants, in nature, in the earth, that it has this innate knowledge, that it has this innate ability to cure us of our ailments. This was the original uh, medicine, that although the plants take longer and sometimes the process is more challenging, more difficult, that it actually cures the root cause. It doesn't just cover the symptoms. In the uh, ceremonies, we like to do three with a day in between each one for integration and discussion. The first one, just the ayahuasca is within you and it is opening you up and it's just you're getting friendly with it. At, we'll skip a day, then the second time you take it, that's when usually you're at the bottom of the abyss. You know, you get to plunge the depths or reach the heights, depending on what's happening. But that's the that's the, the, the primary experience. And the third one, it's kind of the resolving the sew them up and get them out, you know, put everybody back together in a whole place and end it up. But that's just a metaphor, yeah. All right, Dennis. Thank okay. you very much. All right, to our next conversation. Which I guess will be on the other side of the chrysanthemum, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, Ravi, so 
Last night's ceremony was not what I expected. There was no pain or dark visions. Instead, I was shown all the incredible people in my life and how lucky I am. The lesson was simple but important, something that's easy to forget. Be grateful, honor what you have, and those around you. I feel the medicine inside me, opening me up, unblocking me. Now it was time to share my experiences with the group in our first integration session. Today we just wanted to talk a little bit about some tools that we can use to reflect on our experiences and kind of help us move forward and start thinking about what things will be like when we go home. Integration means bringing things into the whole person. When you take these lessons in, it's kind of a process to make sure that it comes into yourself. The Hero's Journal is designed to take you through a self-reflective process of why you're here, what's going on for you. It takes you through preparing for ceremony, reflecting on your ceremonies. And I think I've heard some of you already reframing some of the difficult things you've gone through in ceremony. During the integration session, Dennis told me he had seen some disturbing things last night. While my first ceremony was about gratitude, Dennis had a rougher time and was reminded that the world has real problems. I was wondering if, if you could share with us a bit about this ceremony you had that was kind of one of the, one of the darker ones. Yes, it, it, w it wouldn't be the first time I had dark, dark ceremonies. They, they do come up from time to time. I probably have an unhealthy obsession with 
current events and watching the news and getting further anxious and depressed and afraid, you know, and so that sort of thing comes back on you in your session. It does on me and, you know, my session, the scenario, it was a dystopian fantasy. It was like a vision of what is happening in the world about the darkest and most pessimistic way you could look at it. And all of these things, which are basically the diseases of our culture, you know, the diseases of individual are the diseases of the world. Our culture, soul, is severely wounded. We are in a planetary crisis. Biologists used to say evolution is all about competition, survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and claw. Grab as much as you can, rape, despoil, wreck the environment. It doesn't work that way. Now they're beginning to understand it's much more about collaboration and symbiosis and helping each other. And nature does better when species work together. That's all. We haven't learned this yet. Where does the plant teacher ayahuasca come in to play? I do believe in the concept of plant teacher, and these are catalysts. You know, we're, we're co-evolving. It's all about symbiosis. Ayahuasca and these other sacred medicines are kind of like ambassadors for the entire community of sentient species, and they're trying to get a message out to us. And the message is basically wake up. These crazy monkeys are either going to save the show or they're going to completely kick everything to pieces. Dennis is tapping into some type of ancestral wisdom, something with a message. Tonight, he wants to go deeper, and he insists I go with him. So we're going to visit the shaman to prepare a super strength brew. I'm not sure if this is a good idea. This right here is a concentrated uh, ayahuasca paste, which was which was brewed uh, on site in a Shipibo village by our shaman and his family. And uh, it's excellent. Really strong medicine. The, the, the journeys are more intense. They go more globally focused rather than personal focused. And for my second ceremony, you're gonna give me some of the global brew. If you'd like. Okay. Well, what does he think is the most important characteristic of a great shaman? No tener malos pensamientos hacia otras personas, creer en nuestras plantas y y dietar más. In all the shamanic traditions in South America around ayahuasca, the shaman needs to spend a significant amount of time dieting. So dieting means eating very minimal, very simple food and spending time in isolation in the jungle, consuming one of a whole uh, pharmacopoeia of medicinal plants from the jungle. Cuando vas dietando, te vas y conectando con el espíritu de la planta, no del árbol. En tus sueños, o oh, cuando toma ayahuasca, te sale. Tú escuchas o ves en tu visión Alguien puede presentar una mujer, un hombre, espíritu vestido con vestimentas típicas y te canta. Eso significa que los, los ícaros te están dando.
lo, todo lo que tú ves en su cuerpo, en su mente, en su espíritu, tú vas cantando, alineándole, sacándole. Si algunas cosas que no es bueno, vas sacando, liberándole, ¿no? Y poniéndose un centro. Cuando estabas cantando a él anoche, um, ¿qué viste y, y qué estabas cantando y por qué? Bueno, yo estaba cantando a él. Centrar, conectar, abrir, luego... Y a la segunda noche ya estamos haciendo la cosa que él piensa hacer en su futuro. Más allá, para que vaya más allá, ¿no? Al más profundo. Cada planta tiene su espíritu, pero tú no le ves. Ese espíritu trabaja en ti. El ayahuasca te enseña pasado, presente y futuro. Tres cosas. Eso es lo que te enseña la medicina. Lo que tú has pasado en tu niñez, te vas a ver cómo ha sido, qué es lo que has pasado, qué es lo que has hecho, o qué es lo que te ha hecho a ti. Te hace ver. This time, I'm hoping we can really get a big perspective and maybe I can learn more about plant intelligence, the environment, us as a species, how we interact on this earth, the future, what things look like when we take different directions. So I really need some bigger answers and bigger questions. I'm in the hands of, of Mother Ayahuasca and I got Dennis McKenna on my right hand side, the shaman on my left, so I'm, I'm in good hands. But, I mean, let's be honest. Once I'm in there, I'm all alone, and I'm going to have to just be ready for everything it brings, so. It all came under. I got obliterated. Completely dissolved. All of these insects were eating up my dead body, just ripping me apart. Sending me back to nature, to this giant living organism, connected to all. And it said, this is how powerless you are and how small you are. And this is how big we are and how long term we think. You are just nothing here. Remember this. And then, I don't know why, I got shown all this pain in the world. And I was made to feel it. I got sick. I felt nauseous. It was horrible. And so at the end, it just took me and stripped me the fuck way back down and just said, what the fuck are you, Brian? Like, you are just this little kid that never got the love that he wanted. 
you're just this little kid that just wanted some love and I just didn't get it and I was crying. I was visualizing this little boy and this was me when my parents got divorced. And this boy was building up all these walls around him because he had been hurt so much. I'm just feeling the pain, feeling, feeling this pain all the time. And it's because I just didn't get this love as a kid. I just didn't, I don't, for whatever reason. And I love my dad and I love my mom and I love my parents. I just, I don't know, I didn't feel it. And so this is me um, compensating. And I'm sure Pena sees this. He says, of course, I told you this. You're compensating. You're looking for love. That's a, You're looking for approval. And then just my brain was just t- all this information. And it just started hitting me with these big lessons. Make her your queen. Make her your queen. Because she's such a big part of my life. And she kept coming up. Like kept coming up kept coming up and, and, and I was like, I know this. Gabby as well. So Gabrielle, I mean, you know, but like the last couple of years, she's become a teenager and I'm just not in touch with her. And it's just totally my fault and my lack of ownership. Yeah. Everyone, you know, just everyone. Just, uh, As silly as I'm like, give me the information. That's what I'm here for. It's like you always had the information. You just chose not to pay attention to it. So because you're just being bombarded with all this information, your ego decides what's in it for me. And then I'm doing the me, me, me stuff. And you just don't realize all these things that are happening around you that in the long term are just taking away everything you think you're building. I just need to start investing in these people, you know? I mean, London Real is London Real, but like enough, enough, you know, enough. So we had our second ceremony last night mm-hmm. and uh, I had uh, quite an experience, probably the most riveting experience of my whole life. It was pretty strong, Dennis. Put that in quotes, trademark that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know what you mean. I'll be interested to see how you handle this tremendous download about your family and all these insights. But I have a feeling that you will do things because you're the kind of guy that doesn't just talk. You do things. When we have a psychedelic experience, we feel like children. It's like seeing the world with new eyes, just open to everything. I keep reflecting on last night's ceremony. I felt connected to everything and everyone. That I was just one part of a much larger organism. This leads to one simple truth. What we do to others, we ultimately do to ourselves. Humans cannot be healthy in a world that's dying. The archaic mind understood that nature is conscious. Nature is alive. Nature is an organism full of intent. Our own decision to view the universe as inanimate, as unintelligent, allowed us, permitted us to dissect it, use it, and deny its validity outside of human purpose. 
now the consequences of living like that is coming back to haunt us. You know, we have almost destroyed our home. We have to recover our respect for nature, our love for nature, and we have to realize that we're not running things. Plants, the plants are running nature. But if you look at the way that plants optimize their relationships with their environment through very clever strategies, that's a kind of intelligence. You know, we should be so smart. I mean, look at what we do to our environment, you know. So that's a kind of intelligence. It's They don't think in the way we do. They don't have brains. Brains are overrated. We must give reverence and credence to nature and nature's methods because no other methods will allow us to work our way out of the present mess we're in. I took the full dose of the rocket fuel last night, figuring I was going to go spinning off into other dimensions. Didn't happen. Huh. Didn't That's happen. I was mostly pretty calm and centered the whole time. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> the next one, um, you know, if, if a patient's been operated on, this is like sewing them up and getting them out of the operating room and they're good to go. My third ceremony was just like Dennis described. No lessons or visions, just a deep meditation that recharged me. I needed it. Now it was time to leave. The truth is that I got used to the jungle. It feels good to be amongst plants and friends. But Dennis wanted to show me one last thing, a cloud forest, a perfect example of balance and symbiosis. We're in a race, all the forces of destruction and chaos and dystopian futures. And then on the other side of the coin, brilliant people coming up with good ideas that would really work and that are working. Who wins? I don't know. I don't know. With the David against the Goliath. It is. It is indeed. But a, a grassroots movement can go viral. I mean, these things can happen. This is what we need yeah. to make happen. Yeah, and with so, technology today, uh, messages can go. Internet for that. One voice or a few voices can can really, you know, have have a big effect. Yeah. You are in a position to propagate this message on a global scale. The entire destiny of all life on the planet is tied up in this. We are not acting for ourselves. We happen to be the point species on a transformation that will affect every living organism on this planet at its conclusion. The archaic holds answers, but it only holds answers if we are willing to think of the universe as a living, intelligent entity with which we are in partnership not set against, but that in fact we are a part of an, an unfolding reality that is larger than human understanding. Imagine larger than human understanding. <laughs> this whole thing really changed my life, Dennis, you know, so Thank you for getting me down here. And I feel like this is just the beginning 
I think it is the beginning. It It changed my life, too. You're a great partner to work on this. I mean, you really do have global influence. I think we're going to we're going to encounter some people that we never thought would be part of us on this journey. Gird your loins, keep your powder dry. (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) Man, I don't like the real world. I don't like it at all. I miss the jungle. I miss simple food. I miss going to bed early. Promised myself a lot of big changes and now I have to deliver. So it's all laid out clearly. The only thing I have to fight against now is me not execute. London, welcome to the machine. I felt it as soon as I set foot on the streets. This was going to be challenging. It's easy to understand cooperation and symbiosis in nature, but not in this concrete jungle, where competition is on every corner, where everything screams of separation. Coming back to my studio felt very strange, like I had changed, but everyone here was still the same. Morning, everybody. We're back. I've got a lot of really powerful lessons about my life and about this place. First of all, just um, the people here are a huge resource, and I want to make sure I spend a lot of time with each one of you and listen to you for your ideas and make sure that your ideas are a big thing of this part of this going forward. And the last thing is I want to have more fun around here. When your boss comes back from an ayahuasca trip, it's not the kind of thing that you expect to encounter in a work environment. Uh, you know, things change quite quickly. Well, I want to focus on the people here. I want to listen to my team more. I want to build this space, something that we're super proud of. When he got back, I mean, <laughs> he was very different. He was, he was visibly looser. He was visibly more relaxed. He decided we needed more plants in the office. Listen to the plants and make sure that we don't destroy them because they're a huge part of why we're here and maybe even more important than us sometimes. And as egoic animals, sometimes we think we're just better than any animal and any plant when in fact they have really some fascinating intelligence and they think longer term than we do. He wore some rather interesting shirts for interviews. I'm actually off for two weeks with the family to the south of France. My mom's having her 75th birthday and all the kids are getting together. So it should be a lot of fun. I came back to London with um, grand visions of everything I needed to change in my life. And I start sharing that with people. It's funny, you know, I had an ayahuasca ceremony in Costa Rica. Look, I went down there. I've only been back three days. Mm. I'm still integrating. I get told that I'm connected to everyone around me. You talked about in the beginning, which is we are all one. And so I took a full dose of the condensed stuff, which was probably a double (laughs) dose, probably. My second ceremony, I saw a lot of powerful imagery and feelings about this idea of dissolving the ego, beyond the ego. I got absolutely dissolved and having these individual conversations saying, this is the way it's going to be. Every molecule in my body was just pushed back into nature and it was shown to me that I'm just a small speck of nothingness in the billion years of life. I would kind of fight back and say, no, we are this human race and we are of feelings and we, we, we must at least try to survive. It's a little too much for some people to handle all of that stuff. So I went down to Costa Rica and drank some ayahuasca, plant medicine. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, you want to come do that with me sometime? No, I would never do that. <laughs> you know, they must look at me like a bit of a madman and allowed me to to think about all the possibilities, to open my brain up to all these ideas and, you know, truths about the world. And it's an amazing space, you know, where it does that, you know, uh, pharmaceutically or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um I mean, the ayahuasca experience is pretty traumatizing, but it must be even more traumatizing for the person that hasn't had the experience. 
I think he experienced everything in the ceremony, but it's so hard to describe a, a psychedelic trip. It's impossible, or I don't know what is worse when people really try to tell you what they've been through. Taking ayahuasca, he just had that different perspective that it's not all about him on the end of the day. We're all one and we have to, it's like he has to do his duty. My trip to Costa Rica changed everything. I knew it was time to go big. I realized London Real would play an important part in transforming human consciousness. So we created a new mission, hired more people, and doubled our output. London Real has a new purpose, to create a mass-scale transformation of humanity into a fully empowered, conscious, and cooperative species. Thank you, Sajid. Outside the studio, things were getting real. I don't usually get involved in protests, but I had to find out what was going on. All the policies of the super rich are designed to make you pay. There were a lot of people. Most of them were no more than 16 years old. I had never seen anything like it. And it made me think about my own children. What can I do for their future? But taking part in this conversation is like jumping into a firestorm. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. How dare you? An information war that is separating us from each other even more. Global warming is the greatest fraud that's been perpetrated on mankind this century. In the cosmos of time, of the 13.8 billion years that we've been on this miserable planet, it's not a fart in the wind. This is not about who is right or wrong. People, people, people. This is about the story we tell ourselves as a species. Do we want to dominate nature or cooperate with it? Environment is a huge issue right now, there's no question. Am I worried about it? No, I have a plan and I'm working to the plan. Our plan is along with the natural contours of life. If all of us have the same plan, we can turn this around. Are we going to turn it around? You're asking for a prediction. I'm telling you I have a plan. Are you committed to the plan? That's a question, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> One thing is certain. This strategy for survival is not working. Right now you're happening here as a part of everything else. What the trees exhale, you're inhaling. What you exhale, the trees are inhaling. What you think as myself is just a psychological boundary that you have set up. If you experience everything around you as myself, do you need morality? Did anybody teach you how to this five fingers, this is a small finger, don't cut it off? Is this a morality needed like that? Anything that you feel is a part of yourself, with that you don't need any values, ethics, morals, nothing, because it's a part of you. There's people talking about this, but there's equally a certain number of people who just say, no, 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 let's just have the fun now. Now making money is better than the 80s. And they say my generation ripped the ass out of the world, and I, I was proud to be one of those that ripped it. So how can we change that conversation? The way to start is to uplift human consciousness so that people can stop thinking about themselves all the time and learn to serve. Your greatest contribution to humanity is your own self-realization, your own enlightenment. As you uplift yourself, you uplift everyone else around you. And for me to be the better version of myself, I need to be concentrated long enough so that I can turn my gaze inward, look at myself and go, where are my flaws? My flaws. Unfortunately, the harder I worked on London Real, 
the less time I had to work on myself. So I've been thinking, I want to host an event that brings everyone together. I'm talking about London Reelers from all around the world. The lessons from the ayahuasca were fading and I was falling back into old patterns. So I decided to ask for help. Hey, Sean, uh, thanks for getting on the call with me today. I really appreciate it. You know, I, I've been struggling a bit with this whole process of integration. I'm not manifesting everything that I saw. I don't know what to do. Um, everyone around me thinks I'm a bit crazy. Absolutely, I, and, I, and this is a really common experience of Soltara. We recommend that people be really careful about how they choose to share their experiences and who they choose to share them with. Um, one of the maestros once said, sometimes he doesn't even tell his own wife, because as far as he's concerned, it's between him and the medicine. And so it's, it's that level of sacredness that we really want to encourage people to, to bring to the medicine. I saw these visions of, of what I should be and what I was supposed to become. I see that I need to spend more time with my children and, you know, listen to every member on my team and act like some benevolent God. I wrote everything down in the hero's journal. And then I come back to the real world where, where I have to live. And I can't implement that, all that stuff practically. It's just not practical. And I guess I saw an idealized version of myself that I can't be right now. And that's, that's frustrating for me. Frustration is an emotion. And oftentimes that's where things head. It's like, how do we address this emotion inside ourself? And that's why this kind of know, know thyself, this internal work um, becomes such an essential part of that. When we're just trying to push the change to happen, then that's when we get the most resistance. But the reality is, the great accomplishments require hard work and sacrifice. There's no such thing as work-life balance. There are work-life choices and you make them and they have consequences, period. You're a cunt, Brian, not me. Explain. You're weak. And you're showing and me you, And you want these people to like you. You have no idea how um, limitless it is when you're not afraid of what other people think or say. And you can be more than you are. If these little cunts think that you're something now, I see you a thousand times more. See, they have low standards, these fucking weenies to watch this fucking thing. I don't. I know what you can be. They think you're a big fucking deal. I know you're not. And down deep inside, Brian, you know that I'm closer to being right than they are. There's always a distance with Brian. He's always on the go. He's always on the getting things done. Success is everything and career. He came back with all those different, almost like different belief systems. I felt a bit off what things he said. Quite a bit of change. I don't think he likes to be on his own very much. He doesn't enjoy holidays. He just needs to do something. He always has to do something. He has just a hard time being with me and the children. In August, I had two weeks off, and I'll be honest, four days later, I left and flew back to London alone because I couldn't be the holiday dad. He just couldn't, couldn't stay with us. So I stayed in Bordeaux with the three kids. It was Damon's birthday, first birthday, and he missed it. I definitely struggle with this problem. And what, what was on your mind when you were in Bordeaux? I don't know, restlessness. But I just couldn't get this uneasy feeling of things I needed to do. 
But yeah, this is a big question for me. And mm. even though I know it's part of my character, mm. changing it's another story. Well, this is the challenge. Your core issue has always been a sense of uh, adequacy or inadequacy, or am I enough? That am I enough is a question that comes out of trauma. The work is so seductive, precisely. And when you're restless and unhappy around your kids, they get a message that it's about them. Because children interpret the world in those narcissistic ways that whatever happens is because of me. So this is a highly traumatized society. But I'm saying this is the world that we're living in, so this is the world in which there's even more need for uh, self-examination, for painful inquiry. So, in a sense, the worse it gets, the more it induces people to He was our first guest to talk about how psychedelics helped him transform his life after an injury ended his career as the six-time Mr. Olympia, the greatest body in the world. Dorian is on a journey of healing and self-discovery and always learning and reinventing himself. Recently I read this book called The Secret Life of Trees and it's all about the trees and how they communicate through the root system. So if this is attacked by a predator, the other ones know and they can make some kind of a defensive system or something like that. Yeah. So are they trees or are they just one thing? Yeah. You know, like yeah. people, we all think we're separate, but we're all one kind of one unit at the end of the day. Dorian just had an ayahuasca ceremony himself. A tough one. It was intense. It was, pro it was probably the most intense ceremonies that I've been through. 
all my physicality was taken away. I couldn't literally move. Tough guy, you know? <laughs> okay, think you're a tough guy, a strong guy? Okay, let's see, smash. Now, what are you gonna do? Now who are you? I think the big message there for me was that it's okay to be like that sometimes. It's okay to, to ask for help, because I was not used to doing that. Still, you know, that Western macho male mentality that you gotta be strong always and don't be vulnerable and don't ask for help and all that was just taken away from me. The root of it is a 13-year-old boy that lost his father and perhaps all the, the training and the strength and all the physique was some kind of armor in a way to protect that little boy that still exists inside all of us. See, I felt that I had this great, lost this great trauma and it wasn't really addressed by, by other people in my family, by my mother and so on. Um, and maybe there was some blame there for that, but I get it, man. I get it, this wasn't their fault. They were, you know, they were living their story and their own personal traumas and whatever happened in their life, which affected the way that they behaved and the way they treated me and the way they brought me up and everything. So um, I, I got rid of that kind of blame that I might have been attaching to all that before. And it would be nice if I could tell them that. You know, I got shown my own trauma as a seven-year-old and my parents divorcing and that's something that I think that has caused me to maybe like you become an overachiever maybe yeah. prove myself to the yeah. world I think prove to myself maybe that I'm worthy maybe it's control as well no, but you I want everyone to love you yeah even, even though I tell myself that I don't need it maybe yeah. you got the same thing yeah. you know yeah. and then, it, then it becomes maybe just a, a self uh, repeating loop we all get stuck in a in a mold and that you know that's that's what can happen with ayahuasca you get that mold and she fucking smashes it on the floor the integration process of trying to now become that vision I've seen of myself is, is hard. And I think most people don't understand that. The ayahuasca is not like you're done. Matter of no. fact, it can be even harder when you come back because you see who you could be and then you're not. And then the rest of the world is happy where you are and you have to kind of push through that. Well, sometimes when you go on a spiritual journey, I mean, I, I've said to myself sometimes, I'm like, this is great, but wasn't ignorance bliss. You know, it probably wasn't, but I mean, anyway, you can't go back. For me, I'm, I'm on a journey and I'm learning something every time and I know there's still more to learn. For me, this thing when I was seven years old keeps coming up and I don't know, I'm thinking maybe I should go, you know, talk to my parents about it and just yeah. maybe have them. Well, you're lucky they're still here, that you can do that. I can't. My father died, my mom died, so I can't even tell them about this, but Sure, if your parents are here, man, why, why waste the opportunity? Go, go speak to them. So I emailed my dad and said, um, hey, Pops, would you be up for a short visit from me and maybe even a short interview while I'm there? I need to resolve this, and not just for me, but for my my family, for London Real, for everything. Like if I can't figure out this story I'm telling myself, I'm gonna just con continue in this loop. My guest today is Dr. Joe Dispenza. You specialize in teaching people to rewire their brains and recondition their bodies to make lasting changes. Dr. Joe, welcome back to London Real. Thanks so much, Brian. I'm always happy to be with you. I'm going to San Diego to really sit down with my parents and talk about this traumatic memory I had when I was seven. But I don't think I'm looking for an answer from them because there isn't an answer. I think the only answer is my projection of my new me and my new future. 
right? Exactly what you may want to understand is how they felt. That's more important than anything else, like it would hurt us to see you hurt. Hey, keep it moving, huh? No, lo no loitering here. All right, you don't look like you belong in this neighborhood. Give me a hug. All right, good to see you. Once you understand their struggle, you'll understand your struggle. You were a seven-year-old boy that you thought it had something to do with you, or you thought it was something wrong. When I do these these um, plant medicine ceremonies and these ayahuasca ceremonies. My stepmother at the house I grew up in in high school in Del Mar. This is like memory lane coming back here. It's crazy. When does the story end? If not now, when? Understanding him is going to help you understand you. I remember you coming home when I was a kid. It was just a big deal when you came home. Yeah. But you were yeah. coming home at night. That's what happens when you have a serious career going on and your time is already sold. And that's the way you were brought up. Or brought that's up. just what happens. Yeah, the same thing. It was not like it was, I didn't feel, feel negligent or derelict. So when I was seven, mm -hmm. you ended up moving to a different place. Yes. What do you remember about the divorce? Well, all kinds of things. I, I don't think about that anymore. Okay. There was a, it was all very complicated. Yeah, extremely, right? It's very complicated. Nothing like we planned. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a, lot of, a lot of hard work, a lot of stress on everybody. Yeah, it was. It was something I always come back to. That time mm -hmm. always comes mm -hmm. back to me. Mm -hmm. I'm trying now to not do that anymore and just to like not have that define me and that. That's 40 years ago. I know. Nobody wants to live with their past forever. Time to shovel it over your shoulder. What replaces any traumatic experience is a new experience. And the memory without the emotional charge is called wisdom. You no longer say, I am this way because of that event. You say, boy, that was one of my greatest teachers. And now you're no longer looking back to your past. You're looking forward to your future. That tragedy freed me to live a potential that I would have never been able to do or never allowed myself to do in reordering my life. I had to think about, well, what do I want to impart to you? I really wanted you to have exposure outside of, of uh, just American culture. Probably the reason I'm in London right now. Yeah, I, I think so. They brought you into this world, dude. And that's what you'd be thanking them for. I just want to say thanks, Dad, for being my dad. Love you very much. We wanted you to do well. What if the worst thing that happened to you becomes the best thing that happened to you? It's funny how we get caught up in these stories that disconnect us. We get entangled in these narratives that ultimately don't serve us, that separate us from everything else. 
But separation is an illusion. Instead, we have a choice. To tell ourselves a new story. Yes, change is usually uncomfortable. And oftentimes scary. But isn't that why we are here? To fail, to learn, and come back stronger? To find a way to heal our wounds. Not just for ourselves, but for everyone around us. Because we can change our stories if we truly want to. as individuals and as a species. There was one last thing I had to do. Speak to my mentor about all of my experiences and try to convince the $50 billion man to look at the world in a different way. You know, last year in July, I went down to Costa Rica for some of my plant medicine ceremonies, mm -hmm. ayahuasca. And you were there, Ann Pena. And uh, I need to tell you what I saw. I mean, this is serious. And okay. first of all, um, I pretty much just get obliterated as a person. And Mother Earth or Gaia, whoever it is, pretty much just dissolves me and says, all you humans are just nothing. In the grand scheme of time, you are really nothing more than a fart in the wind. And it was a painful thing to hear. It was brutal because I couldn't run away from it. I couldn't check my Facebook feed. I couldn't call my mommy, right? And on the same note, I came back with a counter argument and said, okay, yeah, but right now we're here and we're humans. And I started seeing human archetypes that are helping us survive and I saw you in a big way, just like your head was right there, pushing us, pushing us to be the best version of ourselves or die. And it was just really powerful for me. So I just want to, um, well, I kind of want to honor you for everything you do, because that's, that's a big deal. And what you do is a big deal. You're trying to course correct a human species that's going correct. the wrong way. Correct. That could kill itself. Correct. Okay. You already think we're fucked. Yes. We're uh, dead. We're all dead. In the next... We're dead. You know, maybe 200 years, 400 years, 300 years. We're finished. No matter uh, what. No, no matter what. But if I, it's like uh, I dreamt five or six months ago, a QLA mentee, probably a realer, came up with a cure for everything. From cancer to uh, impotence to fucking uh, everything. He gave it away. He fucking gave it away. I dreamt it, just as clear as I'm watching you right now. You menteed someone who saved the world. Yeah. And then love worked. That's very amazing. Uh, that's heavy. And that is the true act of love. Dan Pena just said on record that maybe love worked in the end. A at the end. Dan, why wouldn't you mm. drink ayahuasca with me? Well, I'm not going to drink ayahuasca. Um, imagine if you were in power with that. I mean, it could be a force to be reckoned with. I'd probably float. Will you before you die? May, well, I'm going to do heroin before I die. Oh. We are facing a global challenge. It looks pretty crazy out there, right? Our actions in the next 50 years are going to determine if we survive or not. It starts with you making a choice inside. That's how we're going to get through this. And that's why I think this isn't a moment of crisis. I think this is an amazing opportunity. I know because I'm on the front lines. London Real via YouTube and iTunes and all these things has spread these incredible messages. People get it. They want to hear this. All of you want this information. The next level of evolution is seven billion humans come together to create a super organism called humanity. And I'm so blessed to have this technology and this connection. We couldn't have done this 20 years ago. Is this a coincidence that this is here now? 
I think it's one of our best opportunities. What would it be like to raise an entire generation of young people based upon what we now know to be true in science, that cooperation is a fundamental rule? And so I ask you today, I'm asking you right now, who will you become? How will you contribute? And how will you transform yourself? Every day you make a difference of some sort and you have a choice as to what kind of difference you're going to make. What am I afraid of? Ask yourself that. It's really powerful, that fear. We usually run away from it our whole lives. That's actually something that we can learn to go into. Discomfort and fear is an arrow. It's here. It's, this is where the gold is. X marks the spot. What am I avoiding because it's uncomfortable? Almost everything I do these days that makes me happy and gets a result is uncomfortable. What is in us, we have no idea until we start trying hard. It's not always meant to be fun. Question number three that brings it all together is this. What was I put on this planet to do? This is a powerful, powerful question. This is not what do I want to do. Because I want you to be all you can be. Not some fucking regional facsimile. That if we all can do this, we're going to contribute to the greatest chapter of humanity that the world has ever seen. This is our time. Heavens are collapsing. This is the time to change. If you want to raise human consciousness, there has never been a better time. I think they'll look back on this time in hundreds of years and say, wow, they were this close to screwing it up, but they managed to pull it out. Wake up, you monkeys. You know, the first thing you have to do is wake up. Take some action. Transform yourself. I really believe our entire species depends on it. And so on behalf of myself and the entire team at London Real, I just got one last thing to say to you all. Let's fucking do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.